So first about bats in general. There's over 1,200 species of bats found throughout the world. They're found on every continent except Antarctica and they're not found in the Arctic Circle. They account for 25% of all mammals. So we're talking that bats make up huge diversity. And we have 40 bats in Canada and North America, or Canada and the US, and 15 species in Tennessee. And the pictures are a little washed out, but they range in size from up at the top is the smallest bat, the bumblebee bat, weighing in at a massive two grams, and here you can see his, his wingspan. Um, and then the largest is this golden crested flying fox who's native to the Philippines, and it has a wingspan of five and a half feet. And some of the many faces of bats, I call this one the Yoda bat. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Actually, it may look better up. Um, but this bat is native to Australia. It's called the tube nose bat. You can see its cool little tube nose. Then the wrinkle face bat in Central America. This is a horseshoe bat native to Europe, and it has this little horseshoe shape on its nose, which, which helps with echolocation. And then the vampire bat, which of course a lot of people know about the vampire bats. One thing, and they're in Central America, as close as they get to us is Mexico. Um, but one thing I want to point out about the vampire bats is their scientific name is Desmodus rotundus. Mm -hmm. So you can see by this guy's belly where the rotund comes from. And just one fact about them is they eat so much. And you think of blood, it's a liquid, it's heavy. So they're constantly having to digest. So as this bat is flying, when I had it in hand, it looks like it's urinating and it's actually excreting plasma constantly. And then on this one you can see a little bit of blood. He's regurgitated as well. <clears throat> so here's some of the cuter bats. <laughs> we have the white tent making bats. Also from Central America. This one you can't see, but this is our tricolored bat, which is around here. And then I couldn't help but put up the picture of the baby fruit bats all swallowed up. <laughs> okay, now many bats are frugivores, and we have some nectarivores as well. Of course, the flying foxes are frugivores, is holding an apple here. This is an example of a nectarivore. It is a tube-lipped nectar-feeding bat. Um, this one was in Ecuador, and it wasn't discovered until 2005. Now this bat has the longest tongue per body size of any mammal. Its tongue is actually one and a half times the length of its body, and it has this um, complex mechanism for reeling in and storing its tongue. But that tongue is for reaching deep into flowers to drink the nectar. Now one a little bit closer to us is the long-nosed bat in Arizona, also a nectar feeder. And here's a couple other pictures, another frugivore and nectarivore. Um, this guy has pollen all over his face and then I like a little tongue sticking out. <laughs> And some bats are omnivores, and most of the bats um, we have in the U.S., in fact, all the bats we have in our area are insectivores. Um, the pictures I have here show pallid bats from out west, and I think my laser pointer's died now, too. <laughs> but the top one is a pallid bat feeding on a katydid. They are also scorpion specialists, so here's a pallid bat with a scorpion. There is a frog-eating bat in Central America. They're amazing, and they're actually really intelligent bats as well. They're quick learners. And then what we see more often around here is bats feeding on moths. Why are bats important? And one of the things, since I mentioned there's over 1,200 species, they're found all over the world, Bats make up a huge amount of our diversity, so it's really hard to tell if we didn't have the bats what those consequences would be. But if you think of the tropical bats, which are mostly feeding on fruits, um, they end up as seed dispersers once they are done eating that fruit. And 
They are very important for pollinating several plants. So for bananas, mangoes, guavas, they also pollinate the agave, which later goes into adult beverages. <laughs> so for those reasons, you can thank bats. And then with our insectivorous bats, they are important as well, and just for that reason, that they eat bugs. And just to give you an example of how many insects the bats eat, let's take Bellamy Cave. This is um, well, about 45 minutes north of Nashville, up towards Clarksville. And it's a gated cave that's home to 270,000 gray bats. It's gated because the gray bats are endangered, so it's in order to protect them. But <clears throat> each one of these bats can eat half of its body weight nightly in insects. And the bat typically weighs about 8 to 11 grams. So for the sake of easy calculation, let's say 10 grams. And if all those bats are eating half their body weight, that results in 1.3 million grams of insects a night, which is about 3,000 pounds or one and a half tons of insects per night. So these bats, um, the 270,000, they're going to stay fairly close to that cave. They may stay within um, a 20 mile, uh, I guess let's say a 10 mile radius of that cave. So all those insects being eaten there are right in Clarksville. Um, the bats in Bellamy Cave are probably affecting the insect populations that we see down here. Um, one caveat is when I say that the bats eat that many per night, that's nights in the summer when insects are act active and bats are foraging. So in the winter, bats are in hibernation, there's no insects to eat. Um, bats do eat, of course, mosquitoes, which we like that they do that. They're also eating beetles and moths and a lot of our pests to crops. So if these bats and we probably will see a decline. When they do decline, we're going to see an increase in these pests to our crops. So they are really important for us. So we can thank that. And we just passed uh, National Pollinator Week, so um, I hope you thanked that then. Where do bats live? All bats live in caves, right? No. Yeah, oh, I see some hay. No, that's not. A lot of bats do live in caves. And this is a picture of Carlsbad's, Carlsbad Caverns out in New Mexico. Um, typically what the bats do around here, some of them don't use the caves at all. And then many of them use the caves for hibernation in the winter and they move out into trees during the summer. So they're only using about half a year. Except for the gray bat, it uses the caves year round. So, some of the more typical roosts we see are bats in trees. They like when a tree dies and the bark sort of pops off, it creates these spaces. And a bat, it doesn't take much. What they can fit their skull in about this, they can slide into a crack and it offers them protection. Um, another good resource for them in our area are the shag bark hickories, and they have this naturally exfoliating bark. And underneath the bark, the bat can crawl up in there, and it's offered protection from the weather and from predators. And then some other typical roosts are, has anybody seen bats in buildings? Yeah, a lot of them can roost by the hundreds in our buildings, which can not be a good thing sometimes. Um, <clears throat> this picture on the bottom left is of a small footed bat, and it's sitting on top of a rock that is covered with lichens. That bat actually roosts un on the ground underneath rocks. So we'll have herpetologist friends who go flipping rocks looking for salamanders or snakes, and then they'll find these bats in the rocks. And then this other photo I have is the underside of one of these bat houses, and it has multiple chambers, and there's just hundreds of little faces lined up under there. So that's another roost that our bats will take advantage of. Unusual roosts, now we're back in the tropics, um, and we have the white tent making bats again. I just want to show you what their tent looks like. This is, and this is also an underneath shot um, of a tree that's related to the banana, the plantain. And what the bats will do is they chew both sides of the midrib. They'll chew the leaf, and so the leaf collapses. So you can see where it's collapsed down here and just above their tent. 
and it makes this nice little pocket for them. And this tree, for example, is probably only this high off the ground. There, it's not offering that much protection. But um, one thing that's a little counterintuitive to us is we look at these bats and the white really stands out. But if you are a kawadi, which is a relative to raccoon, and you're walking on the rainforest ground or something to eat, you could look up and spot these guys in a minute. Um, when you don't have the flash of a camera shining on them, what ends up happening is the light filters through the green of the leaf and it reflects that green onto the bat so they actually appear as bright white. They're green. They're completely camouflaged. So it's kind of like wearing a, a poker visor where the light comes through and turns your forehead green. So I thought that was really interesting. Oh, and then the other bat, this is a woolly bat in Borneo and it has a special association with this pitcher plant of the genus Nepenthes. And this particular species of pitcher plant, um, what happens is that the pitcher plants have a fluid that will fill up to about this high and it attracts insects. Insects go in, get the fluid, and they can escape so the plant digests that and uses it for nutrients. If it was a normal pitcher plant, then this bat would be getting its face wet. But this species has evolved with the bat so that it has a narrower base, lower fluid levels, and a perfect roosting spot for the bat. Um, and what researchers have done is taken leaves from this plant that had bats roosting in the flowers, leaves from the plant where there were no bats, and the ones with the bats had 30% more nitrogen in the leaves. So they're actually getting a lot of nutrients just from the bat guano. Uh, the headline in National Geographic magazine was bats use pitcher plants as toilet, which <laughs> that's what's happening. But just think of this evolutionary process with this one species of bat. There's several species in the genus Nepenthes, but it's just with the one species. Now, bats are in the order Chiroptera, which means hand wing, and in this image, what it is, is it's the bat's ventral side with the wing extended. So you can see it's humerus, then it's forearm, and then this whole portion is its hand. So it's got a really, really big hand. And you can see it's, maybe you'll see, it's thumb popping up at the top. And then the wing membrane is really interesting. I kind of think it's like a, a latex glove. It's really elastic. So it can move and fly. It can also move back to use that hand to scoop up insects in their mouth, so it's really flexible membrane. And we all know that bats use echolocation for navigation and for foraging. Um, what a lot of people don't know though is that bats can see fairly well, so if it's in an area, some species will forage in the same area each night, so if they're flying down a stream or sometimes flying down a road because it offers good cover, they're not going to be echolocating so well. The echolocation is for those fine details. Um, in the diagram I have, the bat is, is seen where a tree is. But a lot of times, if they know the area, then they don't really need to echolocate. And they can rely on visual cues. Um, but their echolocation senses are very fine for detecting insects or detecting our nets have, or like strands of hair. Um, they can detect those, but they don't necessarily use it all the time. And the way the echolocation calls work is to make it the most efficient they can. Bats, when they're flying, when they do this wing downbeat, then the echolocation calls are kind of like a scream. So, ha! And then they'll <laughs> lift up their wings and listen, scream again, listen. Um, and then most species can be distinguished by their echolocation calls. Not all, but most. And how do biologists study bats? This gets into, we use their echolocation calls. So one of the things we use is a bat detector. Let's see, does anybody want to um, try making a bat sound? What does a bat sound like? <laughs> well, you made, you made sounds. So um, they kind of sound like squeaking. Can you squeak like a, sort of like a mouse? It's not really hearing your squeaking. And the reason is, is because this has an ultrasonic microphone on it. So echolocation calls are ultrasonic. 
and the range of human hearing, so sonic, is from 15, um, what is it? 15 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Um, and that's what we call it our upper range of sonic hearing. And then of course there's infrasonic, which we can't hear, like stomping on the ground. There's an infrasonic component of that running through the floor. So, um, but one thing that does have an ultrasonic and sonic component is keys. Can somebody jingle keys? Oh yeah, <laughs> bats everywhere. Um, and then, so of course we can hear the jingling, but something like this, where you, you can hear that a little bit, but that has a really strong ultrasonic component to it. Um, the bat detector takes that high frequency and then divides it into something we can hear. So it's taking that 20 kilohertz and dividing it to say like 10 kilohertz. Uh, the detector then records the calls. And I do have a recording of a horror bat and it's gonna play on the speakers on my computer so it's kind of quiet, but it's also quiet in this room so we may be able to hear it. It's just a series of chirps, and the hoary bat calls at about 20 kilohertz. That's at the upper range of our hearing, so sometimes um, if a hoary bat is flying by, you can hear it. Bats can also call sonically, so if you have them in hand and they're distressed, then you can hear them. <laughs> um, but here's what the calls look like when the bat recorder records them. The big brown bat has these nice, even sweeping pulses all at 25 kilohertz and then the red bat it calls more radically so it's kind of up and down and that's how we can distinguish some of the calls sometimes um, we have mobile detection so here i am in the back of the car with a bat detector and then there's a microphone on the top of the car so we're driving around slowly seeing what bats are around and you can also set up the bat detector in a little weatherproof housing and collect lots and lots of data And then to get the bats in hand, I guess this slide works because you can't really see the mist nets anyway. But what we have here is there's a string and then there's two 20-foot poles on either side of the pulley system with um, probably like a, a six-meter net in between them. And in this picture, the net is all frilled up because when it's open, it's difficult for us to see, which is precisely why it works, is because it's difficult for the bats to detect or see as well. So it has to be where they're um, foraging along, paying attention to insects, and they don't necessarily pay attention to the net, they'll get caught in the net. Here's what that looks like. So it's like a big volleyball net, just with finer mesh. The bat hits it, and it falls into these bags, and it gets tangled up, and so then we'll go see what the bat is. We look at the species, the gender of the bat, how old it is and its condition overall to see if it has any damage from white nose. If it's an endangered species, we'll put a radio transmitter on it and track where it's going because a lot of the work we do is to locate where the bats are. Um, for instance, if parks want to know where a colony of bats is, particularly endangered bats, then we can find where they're roosting. And a lot of the projects we have are, say, like pipeline projects. Um, where trees have to be cut down. Um, and remember I said that bats move into trees in the summer. With endangered bats, we go, we put the tag on them to make sure that they're not roosting on the trees, in the trees that are going to be cut down. <clears throat> Here's what the radio transmitter looks like. It's just this tiny little thing that we glue to the backs of the bat and they have about a two to three week life and then the glue starts to wear off and the bat will groom it off. So we have a little bit of time to track the bat. And methods of tracking, we have, um, here my husband Steve is holding the antenna tracking by foot. We'll also track by truck. Or if the bat's really far away and we can't track it, then um, Steve will get in the airplane and it's got antennas attached to the wings and find the bat that way first. It just sends that beep. So you listen for beeps, triangulate where it is, and then there'll be a ground crew who will move in closer, and then finally you get to walk to where the bat is and find the actual tree. <clears throat> so has everybody heard of white nose syndrome? Yeah, it's 
a lot of um, press about it lately. And what it is is a disease caused by a fungus that represents itself by um, causing this fuzzy growth on the bat's muzzle, hence white nose. It's very deadly, so it first occurred in New York in 2006. With those populations, about 90% of the bats are dead. We're not seeing that bad of demise here, um, but the fungus, and this is what it looks like under the microscope, is a cold-loving fungus. It loves caves. They're a great environment for it. But when the bats come out of the caves, the fungus will die back. Bats go back in the caves, they can get the fungus again. So this is what uh, the fungus looks like to us. Um, and actually, this is underneath the black light, so it doesn't initially look like this, but it's Pseudogymnoascus destructans. And the way we survey for it out in the field is to put the bat's wing underneath the UV light, and wherever the fungus is, it fluoresces orange, which are those lighter spots. And you can see at the top, it's got a, a bright pink band on it. That's what we put on there. Um, so this is probably a first summer infected where there is white nose on the bat in the winter when it was in the cave. It comes out in the summer, it has some damage, and it looks like scar tissue. Mm -hmm. The next winter, after they come out from that, we'll probably start to see holes in the wing, and the bat can still fly with holes in the wing. But some of these, I'm amazed that they can still fly. By the third season, we start to see the die off. And it was found in Tennessee in 2010. So we're about to that stage where we should be seeing the die off. Here's what the spread looks like so far. There's the circle shows the first instance up in New York, and since then it's spread up and it's spread mainly south and to the west, hitting caves across. And let's take a closer look at Tennessee. Oh, and I did mean to say as of, it wasn't the most updated map, because as of two weeks ago, it was also confirmed in Mississippi. So we had a new state, unfortunately. Um, these are results from the 2013 winter surveys. They're still analyzing the data from this past year. So um, a lot of these do have confirmed where they were green before, they're now confirmed. And <clears throat> Bellamy Cave would be up north, I believe it's in Sumner County. So it does have white nose in it, but we're not seeing a lot of the die off. But some of the things that Tennessee is doing, the Nature Conservancy has designed this artificial cave. Has anybody heard about that? Okay, well, and it's just, it's up in Clarksville. It's just a few hundred yards from Bellamy Cave. And the thoughts are that this can provide a, a clean cave because the cave ecosystem is very delicate. If you went in and tried to kill the fungus, because you can, 409 kills it. Um, Spearmint, essential oil, it inhibits the fungus, as well as there's Rhodococcus bacterium, which this may be the way we want to go. It inhibits the fungus without touching it, but some of these things, and that may be safe, but you can't go in a cave and spray 409, because even if it's not gonna hurt the bats, if it helps them, the bats deposit these large piles of guano, which other cave organism, organisms are dependent on. So there's cave obligate, cave fish, crayfish, uh, millipedes, isopods, there's so many organisms that only live in caves. So once you change something, um, it just goes down the line. But with this cave, the idea is that the bats would use it in the winter, they move out in the spring, and if it was um, white nose contaminated, then you could go in and really, I mean, hose it down and clean it. So when the bats came back the next winter, they would have a clean place to come roost. But what it is, is the ground is dug out, and then there are these concrete um, blocks put in, and then they cover it all back up. So what you see here is a door for airflow, and then the entrance is actually this chimney. That's what bats would use to go in and out. So we're still continuing to do cave surveys and being very, very careful to decontaminate everything. So we're uh, caving in these white Tyvek suits that you can just throw away. You have to have separate caving gear for each cave you go in. <clears throat> we take 
as many precautions as we can, and we're also disinfecting our nets that we use to catch bats. Okay, there are some positive things though. Like I said, the rotococcus bacterium that inhibits the fungus, and this is a bigger bat, which I bet you could guess why it's called the bigger <laughs> bat. We biologists are not very creative with names. Um, but it does not seem to be affected by the fungus. And then a friend of ours noticed that this bat, when you put bands on them, they become kind of tarnished. And he thought, like, well, that's strange. Maybe it's some oil on their skin that's tarnishing the bands. Um, and then also, the bats aren't really affected by the fungus. Mm -hmm. So put two and two together. And it does seem that this bat has an oil on its skin that inhibits the fungus. So this is good news for us. Oh yeah, isn't this talk about bats in our area? Yes! I said all those things lead up to this. Um, I did want to talk about some of the common bats in our area, and we do studies in the area, some <coughs> acoustic detection, some mist netting. Um, the most common bat is the big brown bat, which I do have a stuffed specimen of him here. This is a bat I found dead on the sidewalk on 21st Avenue in front of Vanderbilt. So I made a specimen out of it. And it was the most widespread Pleistocene bat in North America. So they found these bat fossils everywhere. It's very widespread. And there generally aren't many differences in between male and female bats. But in this one, the females are slightly larger. It's associated with man-made structures. The females form nursery colonies, and so they'll have babies in the hundreds, and sometimes those can be a problem. But if you have a bat house, it does like to use those. And they are coleopterous bat specialists. So those are beetles, like June bugs. Um, this is the dung beetle. And the bat has a really smelly breath after he's been eating <laughs> dung beetles. <laughs> If you thought dog breath was bad, no, bat breath can be bad. But generally, bat breath is not that bad. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, we have the big brown. This is the little brown bat. It hibernates in caves in winter, and then it will form colonies, sometimes in buildings, but also in trees. And this bat has been documented to live in captivity for 30 years, and then we found them in the wild living 20 years. So just think about the little brown bat, it's this big and that bat can live 20 or 30 years. Think of something else that size, like a mouse or a shrew, it's got a lifespan of a year or two, and then a squirrel, seven years, and these bats are very long-lived. <clears throat> the tricolor bat's another common one. You've probably seen it if you've been into a cave, or just on the outside of the cave, there'll be a bat roosting, sometimes he's covered in condensation and looks a little dead. That's the tricolor bat. He's a really heavy sleeper, um, so they'll sometimes actually stay in caves in the summer, even though they're not supposed to, say the books. Um, mm -hmm. But they're one of the first bats out at night, and they have a slow butterfly-like mm -hmm. flight, so you may be able to see them. And it's one that bears twins. Then the red bat, it hangs in the foliage of trees. It really looks when it um, closes its wings and it has a furred tail membrane, it looks like a dead leaf. So if it's hanging in a tree, it's really, really hard to pick out. And these bats can be migratory, but they can also be ground roosting. The heavily furred arms, body, and tail helps to hold in its body heat. So these have been found in the snow, with radio transmitters on the back. They'll crawl underneath the leaf litter and roost underneath the leaf litter. And they can take off from the ground. Yeah, sure. How big is this one? Um, how big is the red bat? Its, it's body is like this big, and its wingspan is probably like this. Um, and you've probably seen it if you've ever looked at a street light and you see a bat flying around catching moths. That's usually the red bat. And then the street light illuminates it, so you can sometimes see the red fur. And um, so now you can be a bat expert and go identify a species. <laughs> Okay, now for the two endangered bats, the Indiana bat. Um, this is the one that roosts in trees in the summer, so we'll put radio transmitters to see where they're going. They do this swarming behavior in the fall outside of caves. So what the bats do is in the fall they mate, 
and then the females will actually store the sperm all through the winter, and then they have a delayed implantation so they can become pregnant in the spring. And this one has one pup in June. Um, it takes about three weeks for the pups to be able to fly or to be volant, so right about now they're becoming volant. <coughs> And then the gray bat totally blends in with the background here, um, but it's just an even gray color. Our other endangered bat, and it's special because it's the one that uses caves year round, and it will reach those huge colonies like Bellamy Cave, 270,000. Um, of those, when we talk about hibernation, so this is winter time, all of the gray bats in the world roost in nine caves. Their uh, range is restricted to the eastern U.S., so right in our area. So, um, okay, maybe not all, but like 98% of those bats can be found in nine caves. That's why we try to protect them, because if someone goes in and uh, destroys the cave or, or vandalizes the bats or whatever, then we lose a huge chunk of that population. That's all there is. Unfortunately, they don't seem to be affected by white nose too greatly. So, bats are good and we want to attract them. And a lot of people ask me, how do you attract bats? And I'm just like, you can't. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but then there are some ways. So, bats are attracted to roosting structures, which sure, it could be a bat house, or if you have a lot of property and you have a dead tree, to leave it. Uh, it's great habitat for bats. Um, installing a pond is probably not the most feasible option for everyone, but um, bats will go, they'll actually um, forage and drink from swimming pools too, if you've had a pool. And there are surveys, um, if you do a little internet searching, where people are compiling um, regular folks' data on how often bats are found around their pools, so that's pretty neat. Um, but one way you can attract them is to grow night-blooming flowers. So typically white flowers like datura, moonflower, evening primrose, or yucca. And these flowers attract moths, moths attract bats. And I was a little skeptical at first when people would say that, it's like, oh, I got a bat house and the bats just take care of all my mosquitoes for me. I was like, well, you know, bats, they fly, so they're not gonna stay in your yard that long. But after hearing more and more about it, they really do. If you have a bat house in your yard, it seems to control mosquitoes in your yard. But considering that a bat can eat 600 mosquitoes a night, I mean, it would make a dent. And then I get a lot of questions about bat houses. Um, I did want to say that there are bad places to put bat houses. A lot of what I see is um, people get a bat house and they go stick it on a tree. Um, I guess people tend to think of bats like birds. The bats are probably not gonna use it. They like the solar exposure, they like the heat. And so the best way to get bats to use the bat house is to place it on a pole or a building 12, preferably 15 feet high. And so it gets the um, eastern or southeastern solar exposure and warms up. Wait a year, and then if you don't see any bats using it, you can move it. Um, or uh, this statistic is after three years, 80% of houses are used. So it takes them a while to find it because then again, you can't really attract that to the house. Um, the other thing was that one in six bat houses are actually used, but I think those are sometimes improperly placed. So if you put it in the right place, it's more likely to use it and you can just move it if that's not the right place. And other things you can do are use natural pesticides. Bats in our area eat bugs, so if you're poisoning their food, you could be poisoning them too. Um, and for tropical bats, eat organic foods. So same thing, if you're using, if you're being a consumer and buying organic foods, then uh, less pesticide is used, and so that's less poison that bats are ingesting. Join a bat club. That's the Tennessee Bat Working Group around here. Um, we keep people informed. We have meetings. There's also the Southeastern Bat Diversity Network. And just to spread the word, because white-nose syndrome has um, been very dire. It still is. 
But one good thing it has done is to get bats a lot of publicity, so people are learning about them and learning how <coughs> important they are. So you can tell your friends and family that they don't have to be afraid of bats. Um, and I guess before I, ha I take questions, I did want to show, I've got examples of a mist net here. This is how we catch bats. I'm going to need a couple volunteers. Actually, I can probably take questions while I'm doing this. Does <laughs> anybody have any questions? What's the lifespan? Like, you said 130 years for most bats. What's that lifespan? I mean, probably 15 years. That's documented for a lot of them. And there's so many species, it's going to differ. But uh, it's fairly long lived. Yeah, what's your question? Uh, what do you think bats would use for a bat house? Well, they use it for shelter. They need some place to stay safe during the day since they forage at night. And so we we'll use that to go inside and hide during the day so they're not available to predators. Because sometimes, like, kins will go into caves and eat bats, or um, not very often, but owls can also take bats, so they have to hide from the predators. And snakes as well. Okay. Okay, snakes so may be able to get them. Yeah, snakes could get in a bat house, but then grab that and hold it kind of tight so it doesn't fall. Um, but then the bat house has three quarter inch openings, and I suppose a, a snake could crawl up there, but we typically don't see too much predation. All right, and. Yes, I do mean slither <laughs> instead of crawl. We could just throw the bat into the net. Bat. Let's see if we can catch it. What is the next class? There it is. <laughs> what was the question? What did you do in this class again? Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> next time I'm invited. And so, hey, we caught that. And this just shows, and sometimes if you don't have the net um, very far off the ground, it will hit the ground. So it just gets tangled and it falls into these little bags. But you can see that it is very difficult to see. So even when we have these on roads, you know, I'll go check nets and then I walk right into it. Um, but that's how the this net works. Thank you. How can you tell what they're using a bat box to go, you know, look to see if they're doing anything to look, to look for? Just um, get a high powered flashlight and during the day go and shine the flashlight up there and look. Sometimes, what I typically do is look for guano on the ground. It kind of looks like um, mouse droppings, but then you can see little pieces of bugs and stuff in it, and then, you know, if there's a lot of it, you'd be pretty sure that bats are using that. How do you determine a bat's age when you catch them? Oh, good question. You can't determine the age, like, um, three years from one year, but what you can tell is, I'll use this bat for demonstration, is in the finger bones, um, just like in humans, where the bones take a while to fuse. 
you can see space in between the bones and the bats. So if you can just hold its finger up to light, in juvenile bats, you can see space in between, and then in adults, it's like a knuckle. So all we really tell is one year of age. So we'll say they're um, a pup, which you can tell that they're, they don't have very much fur, a subadult, juvenile, or adult. Yeah? Are you going to give us the specifications to build the bats? Yeah, I do have some. Oh, and I also had, um, there's some great resources up here. I have a few plans. I just printed off one of each so you can see what they are. But these websites, especially the one on the bottom, batconservation.org, it has a whole section on bat houses and tells you all these, um, the great places to put it. And it has the, the plans to put Thank you. Um, this bat house building guide, so it has all the pieces you need and measurements and everything. But what I found really helpful is that he does a video on YouTube and it takes you through all the steps. So, yeah. the vehicle you, you showed there with you and somebody else in there is, is that the Batmobile? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the Batmobile. <laughs> I yeah, expected, I expected it to be black and sleek. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you can buy us one. We'll, okay. we'll take a Batmobile for and, sure. And I did want to ask it: uh, is it both at night and early in the morning that you observe them, or just at night? Typically, we do just at night. There's two peaks in bat activity, so about an hour after sunset and then an hour before sunrise. So we utilize that first peak, so we don't have to be up all night. And we have done some foraging studies where you track them all night, but typically most of our um, acoustic detection, active acoustic detection, because you can let the detectors just run all night, um, but most of it is during the hours of sunset to about two in the morning is when we do um, netting and active monitoring. So they're feeding an hour after sunset? They're feeding they the whole feeding. time. You just see a peak in activity because what they'll do is they'll travel to their favorite foraging spots, which some of those you can see on radar with the free-tailed bats at Carlsbad Caverns. If you look at the, um, like the weather radar, you can see swarms of insects. And then at sunset, you'll see the swarm of bats or the colony of bats emerge. And then the bats go straight for those insects. So there's a little bit of travel time to get to their um, favorite foraging grounds. They'll eat, then they do a night roost, and so they'll digest a little bit, um, rest, or the females will come back to their young and um, nurse them, and then they'll go back out again. So if you have like a creek, you can actually put the bad house, say, up on a hill farther away. It doesn't have to be down by the creek. No. They'll no. travel to. Yep, they will, and some of them do like to roost in riparian areas, so that's actually a great spot if you have a sunny area near the creek, then they're going to use that, but they're not going to roost so much in the shaded areas by the creek. Yeah, but they'll fly, uh, the Indiana bat has, a, it'll fly around three kilometers, which I can't do that to miles, but it flies about three kilometers, and the gray bat, I know it in miles, so about 20 miles. This is a fairly wide range of foraging distances. Yes. What would you say is the most common here in Franklin? Um, probably in Franklin, especially with these uh, historic homes, the big brown bats, they probably love those attics and the red bats just because they're very common. Are there any caves in Williamson County or no? Oh yeah, um, Tennessee has the most caves of any state. I'm not familiar with Williamson County very much, but I'm sure there are caves around here. Well, yeah. they go in a cave that's like the hole is in the ground that goes down or on yeah, the yeah. hills. <clears throat> they They'll use both, um, and especially like the, the bigger bats with the huge ears, they like pit caves because the way that the caves trap air differently provides different habitats for bats. So pit caves will attract the big eared bats, whereas gray bat caves will go into, um, you know, sometimes the size of this room, really large rooms with um, convoluted ceilings. So they can pack in the ceiling and, and warm it up. So they'll use both. Um, some will even use 
not even a cave, but like a, a rock shelter, like the big browns and um, the small footed bats. When you put a uh, bat house in your yard, is it necessary to have water close by? How much no. water do they consume? Mm, I, I don't know exactly how much they consume. Definitely lactating females consume a lot of water, but like they'll use a puddle. Um, they can use like many sources bath? for water. I don't know if, if a bird bath would quite be big enough. What we see a lot of times is on forested roads, there'll be um, wet road ruts, you know, and so they'll use that for water a lot of times, but any sort of creek, like I said, pools. Um, so the water source doesn't necessarily have to be nearby. Yes. How much water a vampire bat drink per night, would you say? Hmm. <laughs> I have no idea. Exactly. Like you saw that one bat, a belly full, but I don't know how much that is. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's, in a, in a book up here, I could look that up for you, but I don't know. Yes. Are bats territorial among the species? Yeah, some of them are. The red bat, and then, I didn't show a picture, but the hoary bat is the biggest bat we have here. Um, it's called hoary because of the whitish gray fur. It's kind of white, gray, brown, black. It's really beautiful. But it's, the body's like this, and it has a wingspan of about 16 inches. But those two, they're in the same genus, seem to be pretty territorial. So um, I've done studies where we were looking at the different calls of bats. So what we would do is um, catch a few species of bats and then we put them on um, kind of like a run. So where we had a, a little apparatus designed for them. So it's kind of like a bat on a leash and then we could record their calls as they flew down, up and down the run. And red bats would come in every time, so all of our recordings had red bats on them. And there is some evidence that hoary bats can be um, cannibalistic. Not that they're, that's, that's not the norm, I don't think, but um, I think it's partly a territorial thing. If they, if they roost in, you said in the hickory nut trees, yes. then they, they would be on the sunny side of the tree, is that? Yeah, usually, and sometimes they'll move around the tree, so as the sun moves, the bat can kind of move around to stay in the sun if it needs to. We see that a lot with, that's why with the dead trees, the, a big piece of bark will pop off, so they do have a lot of room to move. And you can have this much area of loose bark and 100 bats in that. It's amazing where they pack in. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, yeah, your bat soup for Um, it depends. Because the, the tricolored bat, who's a heavy sleeper, it'll sleep a lot of the day. Bats will um, wake up. They wake up to groom. Um, sometimes in caves, they'll get a drink of water. Even the red bats, I've seen them in the winter, just come and get a drink of water during the day. Um, so there is some social activity that occurs during the day, and it's just really dependent on species. Yes? Are they more solitary or group? Because I know I told you I caught a couple, but they were by themselves, and I thought that was unusual. It and depends. We were worried. <laughs> it's no. Um, some bats roost in colonies of hundreds of thousands. Some are solitary, so it really just depends on the species. Yes. How long do the um, mother bats I guess feed the pups until they start eating? Is it one year? Um, no, it's not that long. So. Definitely, um, they're going to nurse the bats until the bats become volant. So for that first three weeks, they nurse. Um, initially, the bats will, the moms will leave the pups in a nursery. And so that's a lot, of, they are um, colonial a lot of times for the nursery colony, so all the bats can stay warm together. Um, they'll leave the babies behind. When the baby's a little bit older, uh, it will attach to the side of the mom and she can fly with it. Once the young become volant, I've, I've caught them together. I'll catch a, a female who's lactating and a young bat. So they do fly together sometimes. And even though the bat, the young could fly, the female is still lactating. So I think that for a while they eat insects and drink milk. Well, which country has the most bats in them? Is there any particular country has the most oh, gosh. in them? You asked some good questions. Yeah, I would. Um, I don't know. 
the country that would have the most. Although, um, and that's another thing, I, I remember looking at this map that does have bat diversity hotspots. So definitely in the tropics. <clears throat> yeah. What's the gestation period? Um, gestation period is, oh, that's another thing I'll have to look up. I'm thinking 90 days, though. And again, that's going to vary back to bat or species to species. And sometimes back to bat, uh, one of the caves that we worked in in Missouri, what we found, and this was with gray bats, there was a room that was a little bit cooler. So it took the bats a little bit longer, a little bit longer gestation period. And then there was a warmer room, which they sort of it up, and the bats become volant more quickly. So they can change that a little bit. And one of the reasons they do that is that the bats that were having babies at the very beginning of the season, so say the beginning of June, um, there's not quite as enough insects available. So they'll have a little bit longer time to get before the young are volant and flying. Whereas the bat, if it's having a baby at the end of June, then it has it hot, whereas it's quick, gets the baby flying, so it can get the most of the insects. How big are the litters usually? Um, well, like some of our bats will just have one pup, and then some have two pups. Oh. Um, and they could have, you know, possibly three or four, but mostly one or two. Okay. Yes. I was curious when you were talking about the white nose syndrome and cleaning out the cave. So does that mean a bat can come in contact and catch it, but then if it goes into a clean cave, the, bat, the fungus will die off? Or um, so they, can they be cured of it, I guess? Well, the fungal spores are amazingly persistent. Mm -hmm. They can reach very hot temperatures and they can be viable for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So a little desiccated spore could, you know, be on the ground of a cave, and then 40 years later, it could, um, well, I guess that would, I don't know, if it sprouts or, or whatever. Um, but what would happen is that in the cave, if you have a bad situation and lots of fungus, if you move into a clean cave, there might be fungal spores, but maybe not as many as there have been. So it, it allows the, uh, the bat a chance to, because they can groom a lot of it off, like in the summertime, Yes, they may have a spore on them, but most of that will be groomed off. Um, but they can, it can be transmitted. Um, humans can bring it to caves. Bats can transmit back to bat. Um, or it, it's just, it's around. So do they groom like cats or more like monkeys picking at each other? <laughs> mm, I don't know. I mean, they definitely groom. Um, <laughs> They groom like that. <laughs> so, you know, they'll, you'll see them kind of chewing on their fur. And um, that's actually probably um, something that's not very well studied because they're always doing it in the dark. Yeah. Um, but there is um, an, an example with vampire bats. I don't know about grooming, but uh, they have been known that if a vampire bat, uh, one in their colony, did not feed, then the others will actually regurgitate the blood and feed the bat. Mm -hmm. So there may there may be some um, communal grooming. Yeah. How big is our eyesight? Can you see it pretty good? How far can you see? I don't know about how far, but they can see. That I don't think their eyesight is as good as ours. And um, again, most of my knowledge is in our bats. Bats in the tropics, like those flying foxes, have bigger eyes. They can see pretty well. Um, and there is some evidence that they may be able to see some color. Our bats probably don't see color, um, but they can see larger visual cues. Like if they're flying, they can see to fly along a ridge top or along a stream. Yes. About the high the bat fly. Um, they can fly pretty high, but the insects don't really fly high. So there has been um, a little bit of research where they've put bat detectors on these weather balloons and put them up high in the air, and they'll detect some of the bats, like the migratory species, um, the hoary bat I mentioned, or the silver air bat, the free-tailed bat, those are high flyers. Whereas the Indiana bat, they mainly fly just above the canopy of the trees. That's where most of the insects are. Yeah. Do any bats migrate between countries or something like that? Like bird or something? Mm, I don't not unless it was between, you know, Texas and Mexico. Okay. But our bats aren't that um, 
much as migrators. Yeah. Although, uh, again, the hoary bat, it is so interesting because it has segregation of the sexes during the summer. And so some bats will segregate into males go in this tree, females go in this tree, or different areas of the cave, or different caves. But this bat, the females use the eastern U.S., the males use the western U.S., <laughs> and then they come together in the fall. So some of those, I mean, are great distances. Uh, yes. You were talking about one of the bats uh, uh, bears twins. Which one is that? Um, the red bat is one of the ones that bears twins. And then I think so, also said an, <clears throat> another one I mentioned it too, and the, uh, the tricolored bat. So they, they just have twins, and then the next just gestation period they have more twins? Yeah, yep. It's they, pretty common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, deer will have twins. And so it, it will just be at the beginning of the season, she'll have the two and then raise those for, you know, like a month or so. And then the female will molt. She builds up her fat reserves, goes to hibernate. Well, wait, mates first, goes to hibernate. And then in the spring, she'll have a new twins. So twins every year. Some do, and there used to be stories that I wish I could have been around in the past where they would see a red bat migration. That's not one that has to migrate because it'll sometimes stay around here, but they would say that you could just see the bats in the skies, and the skies would be red with bats. So they would migrate in huge colonies. And I think there is a lot of movement. What we'll see sometimes in the fall, that's when bats are moving the most, um, you'll catch um, say a whole bunch of silver-haired bats. And those are actually, they're widespread, but you rarely catch them. So they are sort of migrating together. Yes. Um, maybe people are associating bats with mice, but you know, they hear people go, ew, and so how dirty are bats? Did you talk about the grooming? I, I don't think they're that dirty. And, um, one thing, guano is not as gross as mouse poop. Um, for some reason, since, because even when, when I'm talking about these guano piles in the caves, they're, you know, my height. And so we'll be in these guano piles taking samples. But since it's mostly made up of insects, um, well, it's all made up of insects, but um, the insects have that chitin, um, it's, it's just kind of dry and it's not that smelly. Um, and since the bats do groom, I mean, they're pretty clean. I've also done uh, some small mammal trapping. We'll set a trap and like the phrase, smell a rat. Yeah, you can smell it, it stinks. But bats, they don't, I think they're pretty clean. Yes. How do you get a, a person to not be afraid of bats? Because my wife does not like bats. Like, you know, she, every time I tell her I like bats, she thinks I'm weird. So how do you, how do you get a like, you're here. I, I don't know. I think it's um, education. Um, the first time I saw that, I, I got into bats when uh, I was caving, and there was a little tricolor bat roosting, and they are, I mean, they're cute. Mm -hmm. That's one of the cute ones. And so just seeing it, and then um, someone pointed out, like, well, here's a tricolor bat, here's a little brown bat, here's this bat, and it's like, how can you tell they all look the same to me? And so for me, of course I'm fascinated by biology, but just to know a little bit about them, um, to well, know my the <laughs> Show your picture of the tent making bats for those flying foxes. How could it not be cute? Yes, Lindsay. I was just gonna say, um, I've always heard that you, if you ever see one, you're never supposed to pick one up with, with hands. Absolutely right. right, yep. So, if you see a bat, it's probably sick because the, most of the bats that you're going to see, so if you see a bat that's um, cruising along the sidewalk and they look pretty awkward when they're in, at that stage because they're flapping their wings, um, the bats that most people see are during the day, which are sick bats. So yeah, if you see a bat, don't touch it. They bite. Um, they don't like to be handled. When they bite, they do hurt. So you'll know if you have a bite. I think that's a, a common misconception so you're not gonna know when they bite you. <laughs> 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 um, 
But, or if you see something, um, like Jeffy had said, that bats were roosting, bats, bats roosting in a building is normal behavior. Um, so it's unlikely that those are sick or rabid, but still you don't want to waste it, so you don't want to touch the bats. They do carry rabies though, right? They do carry rabies. Um, you are more likely to get rabies from a wild raccoon or possum. Um, about half of 1% of bats have rabies. Um, <clears throat> But the bats that we encounter, if it's, if it's exhibiting strange behavior, then it's probably sick. And you turn it into the health department to see. Yes? Just for you personally, what is your favorite type of bat one? Oh, I've got a, well now, I was going to show this picture. If I can get it back. Oh, okay, good. Um, Sorry, it's a little dark. This bat was so cool. This is uh, when I was doing some research in Mexico. It's a fishing bat. And you can see it's got these long toes. Yeah. yeah. It is. This is the biggest bat I've ever handled. Um, but what they do is they use echolocation. They fly over streams. They're not detecting insects in the air, but they detect ripples of fish that are just beneath the water. And they'll go and scoop up the fish. Now this bat stings, it smells like fish, <laughs> but this bat is so cool. Um, the vampire bats <coughs> we captured were also really cool because normally when you have a bat in your hand, it's a wild animal, it doesn't like to be handled, so it's it's sort of stressed and it'll squeak. If you hold it long enough, it'll calm down. Um, but the vampire bat, it was calm and it looked me in the eye <laughs> and then it looked to where it was, um, now I was wearing gloves, thick leather gloves. Um, it went to my wrist, like it was sensing that that's where the blood, because they have any receptors. And so that bat is like, wow, you're different. And then around here, um, I love the hoary bats, because they're our biggest bat, and they're just really beautiful, and the tricolor is really cute. Speaking of vampire bats, could they survive in the United States, they go to the Mexico, but they could, could they keep coming up north and survive in the southern part of the states. Or um, if, if our climate gets a lot warmer, they're restricted to the warm climate. And the caves they use, the caves in Mexico, are really different from the ones we have here. They're very hot, mm -hmm. um, so that's important to them. But um, I'm sure a vampire bat has probably gotten into the southern southwestern U.S. or like uh, southern Texas, but I think there's only a couple cases of that. But if, even if... How about Florida? Can we survive in Florida? That's a, that's a really hot climate. Uh, I just, they're not going to... Florida's such a long way from Mexico. I don't think they would make it there. I mean, perhaps if you... Mexico, maybe. Huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but not, I don't know about Florida. Florida does have some different species. They have molossed bats. Um, which are from the uh, <clears throat> see the Caribbean islands. So they do have some different species. Yes. Do we have like any bats in the United States? Nope. For now, this is like more like Africa or something like that. Um, Central America. So you'll find them in um, Mexico, Central America. So really, all we have. All okay. I take it back. So some of those different species in Florida, they may eat fruit, um, but we have the nectivorous bats out west. Um, that's, a, that's about it. Yes. Can those nectivorous bats see color? Since they mm. you know how. I don't know if they can or not. Most species that use flowers for food see color. Yeah, but you know, one thing with bats is uh, the flowers are mostly white, so you don't really have to have color vision to see them. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and what's really neat is we were doing a, a study in the Chiricahua Mountains in Arizona, and a lot of people there go camp with RVs, and everybody brings hummingbird feeders mm -hmm. because the nectar feeding bats out there flock to the hummingbird feeders, and we have photos of just, just bats coming in. It's, it's really neat. So I don't. They're probably using scent. I don't even know if they can see the the red. Is that for the evening to do that, or at night time, or at night? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but because that was the complaint, the people in the area, of course, I was like, oh, well, there's bats everywhere. They're eating out of timber feeders. I'm like, 
they clean up my humming bird feeders, I have to bring them in at night. And so they had to bring in the feeders so the bats wouldn't drink all the sugar water. <laughs> How do fruit bats know if the fruit is good to eat? Well, sometimes they don't. Okay, think of in the grocery store, if you want to know if a piece of fruit is good to eat, how would you tell? A lot of people smell it. So the fruit doesn't really become um, ripe, or when it becomes ripe, it, it starts to produce that smell, and that's what the bats are fine. Sometimes the fruit begins to rot and it will actually ferment a little bit. So there are um, cases where bats have eaten the rotten fruit and they fly a little tipsy. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Those are great questions. Well, thank you very much. And um, I do have, I've brought some books if you want to take a look at. And I've just printed off some different things for resources if you want to take a look at those too.